Hello, everyone. My name is Yuria Min, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all today to our panel event, Breakthrough Insights, Creating Access in Healthcare and Economic Opportunity. I am the director of the Barry and Marie Littman Family Prize, an annual global social impact prize that's administered by the University of Pennsylvania through the Wharton School. We are now in our 10th year of awarding this prize that celebrates leadership, innovation, impact, and transferability in the social sector. And we are proud to have an incredible community of honorees, including two of those uh, panelists that we have with us today. We are proud to support organizations like Hope Enterprise Corporation and Care Message that are working to address globally relevant social challenges like access to financial services in economically distressed areas and equity in health services for underserved patients. And none of this would be possible without the generosity of Barry and Marie Littman. And with this fully endowed prize, we are looking forward to the next 10 years of celebrating leading organizations within the social sector. It's my pleasure to introduce Barry Littman, who will kick off our event today with a special introduction. Thank you, Urea. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today and am excited for our panel event. I want to briefly kick things off by sharing how we got here today. As Urea noted, this is the 10th year of the Lippmann Family Prize, and each year we've been so proud to honor three new organizations that are doing incredible change-making work around the globe. This past year, we, la we launched a new prize called the Beacon Award in order to further promote the consistent growth and innovation of our honorees and their impact within the social sector. This opportunity was open to the Lippmann Family Prize honorees from our first six years. We wanted our honoree organizations to know we're behind them and their mission for continued positive social impact. With an additional pool of $500,000, we were able to award $250,000 of unrestricted funds to each of our two Beacon Award winners, Hope Enterprise Corporation and Care Message. With these new awards, we are able to invest more deeply in change-making organizations that are demonstrating success and scaling up their social impact efforts. And so, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel. I'm grateful to have worked with him this past year while he served on the Beacon Awards Sec Selection Committee. Please join me in welcoming Eric Nee, the Editor-in-Chief of the Stanford Social Innovation Review and the Interim Executive Co-Director of the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil, and Civil Society. Eric? Thank you, Barry, for that kind introduction. And thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this year's panel of judges for the Beacon Prize. Even though I am uh, an employee of a rival institution, Stanford University, but a friendly rival, of course. So one of the, my favorite things that I get to do as editor-in-chief of Stanford Social Innovation Review is a talk with the leaders of organizations trying to improve society, both inspiring and interesting to learn about the social problems they're trying to solve and how they're trying to do that. So before I joined SSIR, I covered Silicon Valley for close to 20 years, for Fortune, Forbes, and other business publications, and was always fascinated and impressed by the entrepreneurs that I spoke with. But I'm often more impressed by the social entrepreneurs that I meet and by the work that they're doing. That's because social entrepreneurs have to not only create an organization that has a sustainable business model that can scale up, but they have to do that while keeping their focus on the mission of improving the lives of the people they're serving. That kind of balancing act is not an easy thing to do. The two social entrepreneurs we have with us today, Bill Bynum, CEO of Hope, and Vineet Singhal, CEO of Care Message, are exceptional at doing just that. They help found and continue to lead two social enterprises that are growing and having a significant impact on the communities that they serve. Today, we're gonna to learn why Bill and Benit decided to tackle the particular social issue that they did, how they've gone about trying to address it, what some of the challenges are that they've been encountering today and in the past, and other important topics. So today's session is gonna be structured as follows. First, I'm gonna introduce uh, formally our three speakers. Then for the next 35 minutes, the four of us will have a discussion about some of the topics that I mentioned. The last 15 minutes will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our panelists. 
just post your questions into the Q&A tab, and we'll select some of those to ask of our panelists. So now let me introduce our three speakers. Bill Bynum is the founder and CEO of HOPE, a family of organizations based in Jackson, Mississippi, that includes HOPE Credit Union, HOPE Enterprise, and HOPE Policy Institute. He began his career working in North Carolina on economic development programs before moving to Mississippi in 1994 recreated Hope Credit Union. Bill also serves on the boards of several other organizations, including the Aspen Institute and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Vineet Singhal is the co-founder and CEO of Care Message. Before co-founding Care Message, he was an undergraduate at Stanford University, where he served as a student representative to the Stanford Board of Trustees. During his undergraduate and high school years, Vineet published molecular biology and epidemiology research at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health, and the Stanford School of Medicine. After being accepted to the Mayo Clinic Medical School in 2012 with a full scholarship, Vineet dropped out to co-found Care Message. Our two Social entrepreneurs are joined by Kat Rosketta, the founding executive director of the Center for High Impact Philanthropy at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Social Policy and Practice. The center conducts research, provides education to help donors around the world be more effective. Kat is an alumna of the Wharton School where she received her MBA. She's also the vice chair of Candid, the world's largest source of information on nonprofits and foundations. So now let's get started. So Bill and Benit are both the founders of their organization. So I want to start off by asking them why they started their organization. What social problem or gap in services did they see that needed addressing? And why did they decide to tackle that issue rather than the myriad number of other issues that exist? So let me start with Bill. Thanks, Eric. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you and Benit and Kat. And I'm um, just, just grateful to the Lippman family for supporting uh, our work and so many other social entrepreneurs over the years. At Hope, we started in the mid-90s, over a quarter century ago, with the challenge of trying to improve conditions in the Delta region of Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana region that is home to some of the most entrenched poverty in the United States. And our tools for doing that was providing financing to businesses that created good jobs and offered good benefits. You know, hopefully that would allow people to grab a rung on the economic ladder. I had moved here from North Carolina, as you mentioned, and I'd seen in North Carolina how similar efforts could be successful one and supported significantly by philanthropy, another um, largely government support. But here in the Deep South, we had some uh, business leaders, some civic leaders who recognized that a lot of philanthropy had gone into the Delta, um, political leadership had changed and felt that a more market-driven approach could perhaps be more enduring, could get more traction and could weather the um, the storms, if you will, um, over time more effectively. And so that was intriguing and I was glad to come here and um, have a great deal of support from uh, people who could open doors, could help us to uh, stay focused on the mission. And we've been busy for a quarter century since then. But just a quick follow-up. So what drew you to this kind of work? No, I've been for a long time, I think, wanting to make sure that people who, um, for no reason of their own, uh, did not have opportunity um, relative to others, um, it seemed like it was for no other reason than the, uh, the luck of the draw. Uh, saw people in rural North Carolina in inner cities. I was born in New York. I saw in East Harlem disparities in opportunity. I saw it again when I moved to North Carolina as a young child. And as I grew up, I, I saw it at the University of North Carolina. Um, you know, some students had you know, come with came to school with more 
um, educational, strong educational background. Some had access to internships, summer jobs that opened doors for them, while others it was very new to. And so I've always felt it was important to try to close the gaps. Um, in North Carolina, I saw that um, financial tools uh, were critical, whether it's education or housing or access to grocery stores or healthcare. At some point, financial services, financial tools were necessary. And, and so I was fortunate to get involved in an organization that uh, gave me exposure to how the banking system worked. I'd seen it in, as a young child, how my family were, was able to get access to financing because the neighbors pooled the resources and a credit union that was started in the garage of the vice principal, um, yeah. making access available to communities of color when they couldn't go to the local bank. So I'd seen, uh, I think through all my life, how important financial tools could be to opening opportunity. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Vinit, let me ask you the same question. What was the social problem that you saw that needed addressing and why did you decide to tackle that issue? Sure, uh, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> the, social, the social challenge that um, we've been trying to solve for the last seven years is the rise in, in chronic disease amongst medically underserved populations uh, across the country that has um, only worsened um, over the last several decades, particularly the last two decades, um, and has manifested itself in uh, both uh, increase in mortality and morbidity, uh, as well as the overall cost to our healthcare system, where individuals that are um, below the poverty line, on average, cost twice per capita uh, to the healthcare system um, than individuals that are above the poverty line. And this is both a moral and economic argument um, because, you know, we have individuals across this country who are not able to access the best quality healthcare um, and don't have access to the best quality healthcare, not achieving um, the, the outcomes that uh, individuals with resources are able to achieve, um, and Care Message is trying to equalize that. Care Message is trying to help, um, you know, level the playing field through the targeted use of of technology. Um, I personally saw this problem firsthand working in a free medical clinic in uh, in Galveston, Texas, which is um, uh, close to Houston. Um, uh, right after one of the worst hurricanes um, in its history impacted the city in 2009, 2008, and subsequently the aftermath in 2009, called Hurricane Ike. Um, and it's kind of ironic that we're sitting here um, during a week that another hurricane is about to hit Galveston tomorrow afternoon. Um, and in the aftermath of that particular hurricane, um, there were only a handful of providers in that city that were uh, offering services to uninsured and underinsured patients. Um, and I had the, the wonderful fortune to be uh, a full-time volunteer. I took some, some time off from, from school uh, to work in that clinic. And I had the, the great honor to uh, essentially serve as a makeshift physician's assistant uh, for six months um, or a little under six months. Um, and work with several hundred patients uh, to understand the the challenges that they experience, both from a clinical standpoint and from a social environmental standpoint, that contributed to the uh, consequences of those chronic conditions that that they were uh, experiencing. Um, and I contrasted a lot of that experience with my own experience uh, dealing with uh, chronic disease in my own life, uh, having prediabetes and having wonderful support, having personal trainer, uh, trainers and nutritionists and parents who are both physicians and an amazing endocrinologist at the uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York um, that all contributed to my ability to uh, get better. Um, and that was a very different uh, experience from the experience that the patients that I was working with every single day were having um, with uh, their own healthcare. Um, so, uh, you know, that was the impetus and, and the onus to, to 
think about creating something that could help equalize uh, access to health information and health coaching and, and quality health care, uh, particularly using something that uh, most uh, uh, patients in this category have in their pockets, which is a mobile phone. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, the personal stories that you each have and how directly related they are to the work that you ended up pursuing. Kat, do you find that that's a common theme when in the social entrepreneurs that you work with? Well, I think part of um, what can be so challenging um, for a social entrepreneur to succeed in creating the change they want to create is that um, individuals in those organizations have to understand both at the level of the individual and the household what matters and at the same time recognize that they are working in a space and with systems that often prevent those individuals and families from uh, from uh, accessing what they need to be successful. So um, often individuals who have some personal experience and exposure are particularly well positioned to toggle back and forth between what's practically necessary on the ground and how do you make that happen in these broader systems that often have deep structural inequities that have to be moved? Yeah, no, that makes sense. So to continue that line of thought, let me let me ask you, Bill. So you you saw this problem. You um, saw personally how credit unions could make a difference. Um, oh. Hope is a very complicated organization, though. You not only have a credit union, you have a policy institute. You have a uh, CDFI. You do a lot of education work. Could you? I know it's a lot to talk about, but could you just briefly talk about the array of programs and services you have and why you've constructed your organization that way? Sure. We we try to simplify it for our for the for our consumers for our external public as much as we can. Um, but it is it is clear that. In a region where there are so many disparities, so many gaps, there, where capital has been extracted for centuries um, from communities, particularly communities of color and women, um, you, you don't have the luxury of using the traditional means, traditional banks, for example. We've seen during the current crisis how there are so many entrepreneurs, mom and pop businesses, um, individuals, have not been able to access um, the federal resources, the Paycheck Protection Program or the CARES Act resources uh, at the same level that people in more um, in, in wealthier, more powerful positions can. And so we've we we have we have cobbled together resources and have become a relatively uh, large nonprofit but we're a tiny compared to, to, to the need. We're about a half a million dollars in assets. Uh, some of that uh, was in the loan fund that we started uh, back in 1994, um, which was a million and a half dollars with a um, audacious goal of transforming the economy of the Delta, which <laughs> clearly we couldn't do with a million and a half dollars. And so we knew we needed to aggregate capital in a more efficient way. And the banking system does it very efficiently. Uh, but we felt that a credit union was more consistent, more in alignment with our mission, uh, is, is owned by the community, is accountable to the community rather than a few shareholders. And so that was important, but we can use federal deposits for liquidity to make loans for small businesses. Eventually, we broaden that to housing, to um, basic needs for individuals, for families. And, and to support their children. Um, we, but even as we grew to from that one and a half million to now roughly a half a billion dollar institution, that would be significant in one community, but we're, we're now spread across five states, five states that combine is home to a third of the counties in the country that have had poverty with 20% for a half a century. And so, we try to leverage our experience, the the data that we get, the stories that we get from those we serve by taking it to policymakers, taking it to bankers, taking it to foundations, anyone who controls resources that influence the lives of those we serve 
and try to help them see what a great return on investment can be realized by investing in these communities. Quite honestly, there are communities uh, where the business community, uh, but for uh, people in the Delta's ability to buy their services without homes, uh, without businesses, uh, without adequate income, um, the economy um, is, as we are seeing, is is not able to support the businesses. And so it's in everyone's vested interest to make sure that those who are on the outside looking in have the means to support their families and be contribute to the economy. All right. Benit, let me ask you, um, you identified this, this need. Um, why did you, you know, when you're going about starting an organization to try to tackle it, what were the th things you're thinking about? How did you construct your organization? And uh, why did you focus on doing the, the messaging that you're doing? Yeah, um, we experimented with a lot of different ideas um, early on that did not work. Uh, I think I remember one of our first ideas was to install iPads in waiting rooms to um, get uh, patients to receive patient education that way. Um, and for a lot of reasons, that was not a, a scalable solution. Um, and eventually we landed on using uh, technology uh, that was already available and utilized by our target population, which was mobile messaging and specifically uh, texting um, for two reasons. One is because we saw that the uh, utilization, this was around 2012, 2013, when we were launching the first version of Care Message, we launched in fall of 2013. Um, we realized that the data had really shifted in the, in the preceding decade um, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, factors that had contributed to the rise in mobile uh, adoption by individuals below the poverty line. Um, and the Pew Research Center had come out with a study not too long before that in 2011 that had shown that the uh, there's an inverse relationship between income and education and the use of text messaging in the U.S. and with lower income, less educated individuals using texting two to four times as much in general um, than individuals that were higher income and had more education. So not only was access something that was nearly ubiquitous, obviously not completely ubiquitous, but nearly ubiquitous, but the, the behavior was already present. People were already using this technology to communicate with friends and family and employ, employers and, and, and the outside world. Um, that was one big factor. The second big factor was the uh, Affordable Care Act that had just been passed a couple of years before. Um, and that created uh, a couple of things. The first is it created an incentive for um, providers to adopt electronic medical record systems. It gave providers money to actually adopt uh, medical record uh, systems electronically. And so what that meant was that we could develop technology that could sit on top of the electronic medical record system and drive interventions to patients without needing to worry about how that data was going to flow back and forth between our technology and the patient's medical record. Um, and that could happen electronically as opposed to manually. Um, and then the third and final thing that, that also contributed to, I think, making care message possible was the rise in cloud computing. Um, you know, I think we realized that, um, you know, before, you know, uh, I would say, five to 10 years ago, it was very difficult to create uh, uh, virtual applications and deploy them um, uh, across multiple geographies. Um, it was very expensive to do so um, with on-prem uh, kind of software, but by having cloud-based solutions, you could actually deploy uh, technology very quickly and very cheaply and very easily, and you could start building things and, and, and uh, deploying them very quickly. So I would say like a number of things uh, happened to make something like Care Message possible around the time that we um, we started. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Pat, so, um, you know, in your work at Penn and also in your, um, as vice chair at Candid, you get to see many, many organizations. Um, what, are you, what are the key ingredients of creating successful uh, social change organizations such as the two that we have 
with us who've won the Beacon Award. Um, what are some of the general uh, attributes of a successful organization? What do you think it is about these two organizations, because I know you've had a chance to look at them, that um, have made them rise to the fore? So I'll, I'll start with um, what our team at the Center for High Impact Philanthropy always looks at when we are analyzing nonprofits or social enterprises, or frankly, any opportunity to create positive social change. Um, it starts with clarity around the social impact goal. What's the positive change in the world that they seek and is that change meaningful to the individuals and communities they hope to help? That's, that clarity is, is one. The second is, is their approach to achieving that positive social change consistent with all that we know has worked and hasn't worked. Because I can tell you there's no social entrepreneur today who isn't in some way trying to address a problem that sadly has existed for a very long time. Um, the third, and I think you heard a little of this in both Bill and Vinit's answer to your question, is um, social entrepreneurs are trying, they're very ambitious. They are trying to change things that have proved resistant to a lot of other people's efforts in the nonprofit world, in the philanthropic world, by businesses, by government. Um, and that means that they are always thinking about the economics of what they're doing. What are we, how can we put together um, assets that already exist so that we can do more good with the limited resources we will always have? I mean, it, among our team, we, we refer to this as, they're always linking considerations of cost and impact. And then the fourth is they have position institutions and teams consistent with everything else that I said. So that means things like um, strong leadership that stays focused on the social impact goals, um, that can do that toggle that you heard Bill and Vinit doing between what's meaningful and practical for individuals and families. Okay, now how does this tie to the bigger system like um, the networks of banking, like what uh, the Affordable Care Act is now making possible, right? They, they have leaders who understand and can toggle between those. Um, they have cultures that are, are um, reinforce that focus on social impact. And, you know, both Bill and Vinit talked about the evolution of their work. There is an aspect of this that um, they are relentless in their problem solving, right? Because they're, they know um, that the world changes sometime, often in ways we never expect. But if you're focused on that social impact goal, then you have to figure out ways how do you adapt. Um, so those broadly are what we think about. And, you know, frankly, I can't think of two better examples than the organizations that Bill and Vinny, um represent today. Thank you. Um, well, speaking of adapting, uh, as everybody knows, we're in the midst of the biggest health crisis in the U.S. that the U.S. has faced in uh, 100 years and the biggest economic downturn uh, that the U.S. And, and the world has faced since the Great Depression. You know, one of those would be something to deal with, but having both happen simultaneously is kind of beyond uh, belief. But you're both leading organizations and, and you're in the middle of it. You don't have a choice. You have to figure out how to adapt. So um, I'm curious how this uh, kind of dual crisis has impacted the work that you do, the people that you serve, and what things you've done to adapt to it. Um, let me start off with Vineet. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I still remember I, I got off uh, uh, an airplane from JFK, um, uh, mid, it was the middle of March. The NBA had just canceled its season, much to my chagrin. Um, and, uh, you know, New York had shut down. And um, I got a call from um, a couple members of my product team that uh, things were, quote unquote, blowing up. Um, and uh, what they meant by that was, uh, you know, the, that the utilization of our uh, platform was was dramatically increasing um, around the middle of March. And obviously we had been aware of what was going on, but we didn't realize how quickly um, things would escalate to um, 
the point where um, the way that healthcare was delivered uh, would just fundamentally change um, over almost overnight. Um, and you know whether it's the shift from in person to telemedicine, whether it's um, the move from you know, elective procedures and, and screenings to you know dedicating resources towards the management and prevention of COVID-19. Um, it became very clear that uh, communication around those topics was top of mind for our customers. And, and uh, I, I think the utilization of one of our features um, within the care message platform grew by 700 uh, percent between mid-March and um, I believe mid-April. Um, so uh, the first thing that we had to do was essentially, you know, all hands on deck, stand up more servers, and um, our engineering team worked, you know, through the night, uh, through the weekends, to make sure that every single message, every single piece of communication that needed to reach a patient, made its way through. Despite, you know, the fact that our platform really wasn't designed for, um, you know, emergency communication during a pandemic, we we made that work during uh, a very difficult time. And then once we had done that, uh, which was not a uh, not a trivial undertaking, um, we started to think about, you know, what is our responsibility, not just to our existing partners and organizations that are already using our, our technology, but to the broader safety net ecosystem in the, in the country that is looking for solutions like Care Message to communicate with their patients and whether it's driving testing whether it's collecting uh, screening uh, answers to screening questions before a test, whether it's coordinating telemedicine, whether it's coordinating medication pickup or food pickup or connecting people to resources, you know, on and on and on, the list goes on. Um, you know, we, we felt like we had a broader responsibility. So um, again, almost overnight, we uh, stood up a separate uh, version of Care Message called CM Lite. Uh, uh, which is uh, a COVID-19 version of our platform. And as opposed to uh, offering at a cost to safety net organizations that were not using care message already, we decided to make it completely free. Uh, and as opposed to it being a 10 week implementation process, we figured out a way to uh, make it a one day implementation process because we knew that organizations needed to get up and running and start communicating with their patients around all sorts of things. Um, and we were fortunate to have our existing donors and some amazing new funders, including Johnson & Johnson, come in and support this work. And so um, in the last four or five months since we launched this, um, we have supported over 130 safety net organizations across the country with CM Light. Um, and that has enabled us to reach several million new patients that we would not have been able to reach without, um, you know, uh, doing this work. Um, and uh, we have in total facilitated uh, around 20 million messages related to COVID-19 um, uh, across about 300 uh, or so, or just under 300 safety net organizations um, in 30, 40, 30 to 40 states nationally. So it's been a uh, an amazing undertaking by our team uh, to kind of uh, almost pivot uh, half of the organization overnight. Wow, that's impressive. Um, Bill, let me ask you the same question. Um, I'm sure that uh, COVID and the economic downturn have unfortunately impacted Hope. Could you talk a little bit about it, and particularly as a financial institution, um, you know, what the impact of people being out of work, uh, businesses having to close uh, has had on uh, your organization, well, your communities, importantly, but also your organization. No, it's it's interesting. I think in many ways, Hope and other community development financial institutions like like Hope uh, were created for times like these. Um, you think about our evolution, whether it's going into a region that is so underbanked and so impoverished, trying to provide financial tools and and improve conditions. Um, then after Hurricane Katrina, we saw how crisis devastated people in the Lower Ninth Ward, um, communities of color, low-income residents, 
uh, disproportionately. We saw it after the financial crisis. And in each of those circumstances, we were able to step in and because there were gaps and, and roll up our sleeves and try to address those gaps. After Hurricane Katrina, we provided, we built some of the first homes on the, the Gulf Coast and, and helped thousands of people in New Orleans um, get accounts so they could get their FEMA checks and insurance payments and help businesses get back on their feet through partnerships with so many groups. And so we uh, had developed great relationships, um, tools, um, and had been steeled, evolved through trial by fire. And so when we were hit, uh, I think it's, it's probably a triple crisis. It's a healthcare crisis, it's, anomic, it's an economic crisis, and it's a racial crisis um, when you look at what we're facing now. And again, we have seen how um, important capital, capital is, um, is, is a Swiss army knife. Uh, whether it's uh, providing access to health care or education facilities or homes or grocery stores. And in this case, you know, helping families and businesses um, stabilize and survive, uh, particularly in underserved communities where where you have such a large percentage of of, of people of color who are in the service sector and in the retail. Sector. And again, when you saw the Paycheck Protection Program, which was the primary vehicle for helping businesses survive, um, being routed through traditional banks that, quite honestly, have never had a strong track record of serving certain segments of the economy. When you see that a homeowner, um, a family who, a black family who makes $150,000 in Mississippi, is less likely to get approved for a mortgage loan than a white family that's got a $30,000 uh, income. You see systemic uh, disparities in the financial system. Um, when you see, uh, was it, I think it was Duke Northwestern that recently did a study that showed that the black-white wealth gap for families with children is 100 to 1, not the 10 to 12 to 1 for black-white households versus white households in general, but 100 to 1. And so you, you've got to be very targeted in directing capital to communities that are on the outside looking in. And so we have done that again in crises uh, throughout the course of our existence. And so after the, um, when the pandemic hit and businesses started shutting down, uh, we, instead of closing 40 to 50 business loans in a year, we closed Oh, we, we, we approved over 3,000 paycheck protection loans in five months. Um, so 50, 60 times our normal uh, output. And that's uh, I think a testament to an incredible group of colleagues who um, um, are, are committed to the communities that they live in and also to the resilience of the people we serve. They, 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 they have come to trust us and they look increasingly to hope as a resource that um, um, can help them address those critical needs. And so we're, we're, we're seeing that there are niches, and gaps that we are able to fill, and I fully anticipate those um, will continue to do that as we work through this crisis and hopefully come out better on the other side. Well, um, Kat, so you raise your hand. Let me let me just also pose a question, and maybe you're going to answer this. But you know, I'm quite impressed by both organizations in how they pivoted so quickly, changed the way that they were doing business, vastly increased the services and programs they were providing to people. I mean, not all organizations can do that. What does it take to 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 be able to do that? So you may have wanted to answer a different question. So why don't you go ahead and do that first, and then then you can answer mine. Uh, well, hopefully this, what I wanted to say may lead in, into your question. I, I just, as Bill was speaking, and um, I wanted to build off of the perfect, awful storm that he articulated that of healthcare crisis, economic crisis, and um, racial crisis, particularly in the United States. And um, it just was a great reminder that 
You know, the definition of a crisis is that it overwhelms the systems that we typically rely on to manage. And one of the things that's become so apparent because of the scale of our current crises is that organizations like Bills and like Vineet, who whose value may not have been as obvious, frankly, <laughs> when things were going as well and all the bigger systems were in place, are critical. And there have been articles about how businesses may need to look at some of the smaller nonprofits to understand what it really means to be able to pivot in crisis, right? And, and Bill and Vineet gave fantastic examples. And I think part of why they were able to pivot so well in crisis is because their models are focused on the two things that are most needed to respond to a crisis, capital and timely, reliable information. That's how you get out of crises, access to capital and access to timely, reliable information. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of, while, while we're here celebrating their work as compared to some of the um, other really impressive organizations that apply for the Beacon Award. I, I actually think what they're doing is a model for how communities have to be prepared to respond to crisis. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So um, we do have some questions from our audience and we're right at that time. So I'm gonna throw out one of them. Uh, the problems both your organizations are working to address are so large and systemic. What do you think it would take to fully solve these problems of inequity in healthcare and economic opportunity? And what do you need everyone else to be doing alongside the work you're already doing? So talking about changing big systems. Uh, Bill, let me ask that question at you and then I'll have the same question for Vineet. Sure, I think for us, we are proud that we are able to help as many people as we can, but we also know that relative to need, we are, we're, we're, we're a drop in the bucket. And so that's why we focus so much on taking our data, taking the voices of our owners. The, you know, we, are, we are a, um, we're owned by uh, people of color. Majority of our owners are women. So we're accountable to them and we, we, we take very seriously our role of taking their voices to the halls of power. We go to Congress, we go to the State House, we go to the business round table and ask them, what does it mean when you say your statement of purpose is an economy that works for all Americans in places like the Alabama Black Belt and the Mississippi Delta? And we help them see. I think we're also R and D arm that show them if you make smart investments, what kind of return you can get on those investments. And so I think it will take more people. I think particularly the business sector uh, understanding their vested interests. Uh, I think it will take um, American citizens holding those who sit in positions of power more accountable. You know, I don't. I don't think any of us. Um, are excited about the division that we see in the country. And we know that is not what we signed up for and that that's not what we voted people in the office to do. And so I think in more accountability, uh, providing them, as Kat said, with data. <laughs> I think that you know, making sure that they remember um, what's going on in their communities and what their communities and constituents need. Um, so I, I think I think, I think policy that respects people, uh, regardless of where they were born, what their color is, what their gender is, and and, and that I think really makes the decisions, makes the make sure the policies protect um, um, individuals. Um, that in our case, that access to affordable uh, financial services are available. I think I think it should be a human right. I think it's no one should have to rely on a paycheck, uh, a payday loan or a, a pawn shop for basic tools that we know we all need to support our families. Yeah. The neat healthcare, um, certainly a big system. 
uh, one in which there are many players and, and uh, the government and the private sector both have key roles. Um, what do you think is going to take to change the healthcare system for the better? What can you do and what can other organizations do to help? Yeah, um, we've thought a lot about this and, um, you know, just like Bill mentioned, I, you know, I think we, we also recognize that the problem is, is much bigger than um, I think what any individual organization can do. Um, but I think that there are a couple of things that, um, you know, we're thinking about more and more um, that I think will accelerate our impact and, and will also accelerate the uh, transition or the change that we want to see in the broader ecosystem, at least for um, the delivery of healthcare to the populations that we serve. Um, and for us, it really boils down to understanding what really drives health outcomes. And when you look at it, you know, roughly about a quarter of the impact on health outcomes um, is directly tied to the clinical care that patients are receiving um, in healthcare settings. Um, the rest of it, the vast majority, uh, you know, a uh, lion's share of that, that impact is tied to things like access to food, access to housing, access to capital, access to so many other things that, that impede people's ability to live healthy lives. Like if you're not able to afford um, rent for the next you know, few, few weeks, you're probably not going to be able to do a lot of things that a you know, uh, care message recommends that you do if you have a chronic uh, disease or if you're not able to get access to healthy food options and other things uh, related to that. So, you know, we recognize that and uh, we, we know that that needs to change. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out a way that we can better empower our customers, which are, who are often the, um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the most critical change agents and, and sources of uh, relief and resources for the population that we serve, uh, community clinics, free clinics, other organizations in the safety net, CBOs, et cetera, um, empower them with technology tools that can help them really accelerate their own ability to A, understand uh, what needs people are experiencing, whether it's food insecurity or housing instability or employment, unemployment or underemployment, uh, et cetera, um, and then, you know, through the use of, of technology, um, be able to actually connect people to resources, whether it's resources like Operation Hope or a food pantry or other, other, other resources that they might be avail that might be appropriate and available to them. Uh, and then also over time, connect with them and close the loop to make sure that patients actually receive that particular service. Um, and if they didn't, provide something else. And what our hope is, is that by using technology, we can actually make the existing very manual ways in which clinics are doing this much more efficient and much more effective um, by, by uh, not replacing human beings, but rather empowering human beings, which are a very limited resource in, in underserved uh, communities and, and particularly organizations that serve underserved communities um, we think we can help them uh, increase their reach and, and we can help them do more with less. Um, and, and so that's really what we're trying to do uh, because we know that that's really how we're going to make systematic change and how, um, how uh, uh, you know, the, the populations that we serve um, achieve equitable health outcomes. So we have another question here. Um, are there financial management principles that Bill and Benita apply in their organizations to ensure their stability and ongoing growth? And I'm gonna uh, just uh, modify the question a bit and throw out a cap, which is, you know, both organizations uh, have a, a revenue model, uh, earned income model, um, as well as uh, accepting uh, grants. Um, Kat, do you think, uh, I mean, you've looked at, it's not the only way to, to, to run a nonprofit, but it 
certainly can provide some financial stability. Um, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, these two organizations, their their financial model, and and any principles that that you could uh, provide to our audience about, you know, how to how to create a financially sustainable nonprofit organization. One of the things that is idiosyncratic to nonprofits um, is that uh, a dollar isn't actually a dollar, meaning because philanthropy, foundations, and donors restrict funding, um, you can't just spend that dollar on what you think, as the leader of an organization, will best serve your mission. You also have to take into account whatever restrictions um, the funder provided, and, and that can actually also be true, uh, even though it's earned, of government contracts, right? Um, so any time an organization is able to build into their business model and earn revenue stream that can be used in whatever way is needed to achieve its mission, the faster it can move to achieving its mission. Because any restriction, whether it's government or philanthropic, if you see an opportunity as the leader of an organization that you think will better serve your clients before you can actually jump on it, when you're talking about underserved communities who often need that help urgently, you have to go back and renegotiate <laughs> with the funder or the government agency, and that slows things down, right? So, so that is the reason why most social purpose organizations seek opportunities for earned revenue because that kind of financing can accelerate your work. Um, but it's not so easy to do. So again, it's, it's yet another reason why I think um, uh, Bill and Vinit's organizations um, are such great models for others because they've been able to build that in a systematic way. Yeah. Um, so SSIR, where I work, we have a we have mostly it's an earned income model as well. Um, but continually we're faced with you know choices, right? Um, about staying on mission um, or, you know, going after money. And I'm sure that Vineet and Bill face those issues constantly. Um, Vineet, could you uh, talk about that and, and uh, you know, kind of how you think about those choices? Yeah, um, I think one of the most common questions that, that I get as I'm out there, um, uh, you know, fundraising for Care Message is why are you not a for-profit business? Um, given you know our, our focus on technology, our focus on um, you know uh, you know acquiring customers and and running a fairly traditional um, software as a service uh, SaaS business, um, you know, obviously one that has a very strong mission. Um, and I, I think there are two reasons why. Uh, the first is that you know being a nonprofit allows us enormous flexibility um, in terms of the kinds of customers we choose to work with and choose to acquire um, and support, uh, rather than feeling the pressure to go, uh, quote unquote, up market um, and serve um, already well-served uh, uh, organizations that have a lot of resources, but are not serving the target patients that we want to serve and, and focus on. Um, you know, we have chosen to uh, work with organizations that actually don't have a lot of resources, uh, but are serving, you know, tens of millions of, of underserved patients uh, across the country, exactly the population that we want to serve, people on Medicaid, people that don't have health insurance. Um, and uh, about a third of our customer base uh, are organizations that uh, don't pay us anything or pay a very nominal fee that's one to two percent of what our, what our other customers pay us. And these are free and charitable clinics that are serving people that have no health insurance whatsoever or, or uh, are underinsured. Um, so I think that's one big reason. The second reason, more to your question about the conflict between impact and revenue, um, you know, we have had situations where um, certain organizations or certain customers have asked us to build things that um, uh, would not necessarily be in the best interest of our customers or I'm sorry, in uh, best interest of our mission. Um, so as an example, you know, we've had organizations 
um, ask us to build functionality that would allow them to collect outstanding uh, payments from patients um, using care message. Uh, and we have refused to do that because that's not aligned with our mission. Uh, even though it might provide financial value to our customers, uh, we don't believe that that's going to help people get healthier. We, we don't believe that that's going to have, in fact, we believe it's actually going to have the opposite impact, which is it's going to turn people off from engaging with all the important health content that we want them to engage with. So um, that's okay. Uh, they can they can find those uh, functionalities in other places. Um, but our focus is, is going to be mission first and, and revenue second. Bill, um, we have just a couple of minutes, but I'm curious to hear um, how um, Hope has uh, addressed the, those kind of juggling acts that you have to do. Uh, very similar to what Neat and Cat said, the mission always wins. We, you know, nonprofits are businesses, uh, hospitals are businesses, schools are business. You know, we have payroll, facilities, technology, R&D, administrative expenses. Many times philanthropy or government doesn't value that as much as we need them to. Um, but at the end of the day, the mission has to drive uh, what we do. Um, we, again, whether it's, uh, it didn't make any sense in, on one hand after Hurricane Katrina for us to go from 50 to 150 people in two and a half, uh, in less than a year and to grow from you know, 4,000 to 9,000 members, but that was what the situation demanded. We grew from eight to 30 locations after the financial crisis, you know, not because banks were leaving these communities and people did not all of a sudden stop needing basic financial tools. And so the mission drove us to do that. Um, we did not have a clear knowledge, clear sense of where the funding was coming from, but we were clear in the commitment um, and capacity of our colleagues. So we used what we had and built on it. And fortunately, we've been able to make the case. And I see now where so many uh, funders are looking and businesses are looking more at investing in the nonprofit sector. I think, uh, again, uh, the uncertainty around what to expect from government. Um, we, uh, nonprofits are grounded in the communities. And so we're glad that we're seeing more attention on these, on the work that they do. I think that's a good place to end. Um... These are both mission-driven business uh, organizations, businesses, um, and I think uh, Need and Bill both <clears throat> do a good job of explaining what that means and, and are really exemplary organizations, which is why they were uh, chosen to win these uh, inaugural Beacon Awards. So unfortunately, we have a lot more questions, but we don't have time. Um, so I want to turn it over. First of all, thank Bill, Kat, and Benit for doing such a great job. I really didn't have enjoyed uh, moderating this uh, uh, this session this afternoon. I want to turn it over to Uriah to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks so much for moderating this panel conversation today. And thank you, Bill, Vanit, and Kat for just sharing your stories and insights. As everyone noted um, and is well aware, we're in the middle of incredibly challenging time facing both a global health crisis and a global economic downturn and a combination that has led to that, that perfect, awful crisis. And it's clear hearing from you all today just how important it is for us to be supporting the work of leading social sector organizations like HOPE and Care Message that are having such a significant impact in the communities you're serving and really leading the way in, in addressing these globally relevant social challenges and working to provide um, urgent and basic essential needs of capital and timely, reliable information. And we're just so glad to celebrate Hope and Care Message as our inaugural Litman Family Prize Beacon Awards winners and to have you both on this panel and to share how you're working to create that access and, and fight for equity in both healthcare and ec economic opportunity. Uh, thank you again also to Barry and the Littman family for facilitating this opportunity through your generous endowment at Penn. And we look forward to more opportunities to celebrate incredible change-making organizations in the future. Thank you all for joining us for this virtual panel event, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.